Someone has to say it, the Horus Heresy is a tricky game to get your head round, particularly if you are a beginner. In today's video, I'm going to be explaining some of the fundamental game mechanics which underlie most of Games Workshop's games. We'll be covering a few examples as we go through to help you learn, but before we get started, there are a few things that you'll need. First, you'll need a measuring device of some kind. Now most people use a tape measure, any old tape measure will do, but some people do also use rulers, measuring sticks or other measuring widgets to get their armies into the right positions on the battlefield. Now for your first couple of battles it doesn't matter what you use so long as you've got something that measures in inches. You'll also need something to represent your units on the battlefield. Now throughout today's tutorial we're going to be tracking a squad of Blood Angels Legionaries taking on a squad of Alpha Legion Legionaries. Now don't worry if you haven't got an epic painted army straight away, even small bits of cork or cardboard can serve as an army in a pinch, they're just going to require a little bit more imagination. The next thing you'll need are some dice. Now dice are essential to all Games Workshop games as they help to provide a bit of drama and intrigue and an element of luck to all of your battles. All you'll need to follow along with today's tutorial is a few six-sided dice which are sometimes referred to as D6s. You'll also need a copy of the rules, in this case I've got the rulebook out of the starter set, and then you'll also need a space to play. A kitchen table is going to work for your first couple of battles, so don't worry too much about having a massive area to play on. Now you can get everything you need to get started in the new Horus Heresy Age of Darkness box set, but as it's quite a hefty price tag for a beginner, all you really need to get started is your favourite box of minis and a space to play on. Now epic heroes of legend will perform very differently to lowly line infantry, even if those line infantry are 7 foot tall superhumans. In order to represent this in the game, each unit has a specific set of characteristics which determine how it performs. For examples, we're going to be looking at one of the more basic units in the game, the Legion Tactical Squad. First up in terms of their characteristics is M, which stands for movement. Now these guys have a movement value of 7, which means they can move a grand total of 7 inches in any direction when manoeuvring across the battlefield. Next is WS for Weapon Skill. This determines how good the model is in close combat. Higher numbers represent a better capability with the melee weapons of the 31st millennium. Our legionaries are Weapon Skill 4. Hardly a slouch, but no match for some of the most skilled swordsmen in the Imperium. Next we have BS or Ballistic Skill. This indicates how good the model is with firearms. Again, a higher number represents a better marksman. Our legionaries are Ballistic Skill 4, making them an average shot. Next is S for strength. How much weight is coming behind the attacks coming in from this unit? Dreadnoughts, demons and larger models may have strengths as high as 9, but this legionary squad has a strength of 4. Ranged and melee weapons also have a strength value, indicating how good they are inflicting damage on the enemy. Our legionaries are armed with bolters, which are strength 4 weapons. The defensive counterpart to strength is toughness. How hardy are these models? How likely are they, when they get hit, to be wounded by the attack? For toughness again, our legionaries have a toughness value of 4. This also ties into our next value, W, for wounds. Each of our tactical marines has a wounds value of 1. This means they can only take a single point of damage before being removed as a casualty. Next is I for initiative. This represents the speed of the model and helps determine how quickly they get to fight in close combat. Again, our legionaries have an initiative value of 4. Next is A for attacks. How many times can he swing with his fists, swords, daggers or any other melee weapons? In this case, each of our legionaries gets one attack. LD for leadership next, representing the bravery of the squad. This is mostly used when taking morale checks, which we'll discuss later, but effectively they are to determine whether or not your model is going to stick around in the face of the terrifying foes he's going to face. Lastly for the characteristics is SV, the save of the model. All of our legionaries are clad in power armour, which gives them a chance to resist even the most grievous of wounds. The power armour grants them a 3 plus save, which is a pretty good save. Each of these characteristics is used in various different ways across the different phases of the Horus Heresy. So let's look at those phases next in order to determine how to play the game. Games of Horus Heresy are played out over multiple turns with players alternating, moving and fighting with their models. We're going to be imagining that the Blood Angels player is going first. Now I've left out reactions which I'll be covering in the next part of this series. We'll be keeping everything nice and simple in this video so if it's your first time playing, grab your models and play along. You can see how your models do compared with how mine end up in the battle. The first phase of the game is the movement phase. This is where you can manoeuvre your models into advantageous positions. For each of your units you have two main options here. You can either move or you can run. 
For movement, it's just as we described before. You take the movement value of the squad, in this case, seven inches, and maneuver them in whatever direction you want. They don't have to travel the full seven inches, and they don't even have to move at all if you don't want them to. If you choose to run, the same rules for movement apply, but you also get to add your model's initiative value to the distance that you move. This is to represent your model running at full pelt. Because our tactical squad has a movement value of seven and an initiative value of four, that means they can move a maximum of 11 inches. The disadvantage is that when you run with a unit, you won't be able to shoot with them in the next shooting phase because they won't have time to get their guns ready as they've been sprinting at full speed. Each model within a unit must be within two inches of at least one other model from that unit to maintain unit coherency. Now, rather than having my guys sprint, because I want to show you shooting in the next phase, I'm gonna move them back and then have them move seven inches towards the Alpha Legion. With maneuvers declare, let bolter shells fly, it's time to move on to the shooting phase. Now there's a handy chart to describe the shooting phase in the rulebook, but it can be summarized like this. First, we pick a unit. In this case, I'm gonna pick my Blood Angels Legionaries. Then we pick a target for them to shoot at. In this case, the Alpha Legion Legionaries. Next, we're gonna choose the weapon that they're going to shoot with. In this case, all of my Marines are armed with bolters. The bolter has a range of 24 inches. You can't ever target a unit that's outside of your weapon's range. Now we move on to a three-step process where we actually roll the dice to determine what happens with the shots from our models. First up is a roll to hit. To do this, we first need to work out how likely it is that our models are going to hit their target. For this, we're gonna use the ballistic skill that we mentioned previously during the characteristics section. Because our guys have a ballistic skill of four, they're going to be hitting into the Alpha Legion on a three. There is a chart in the rulebook to help you remember the hit rolls on your models. An easy way to remember it is you take away the model's ballistic skill from seven, and that determines the dice roll you need in order to be able to hit the enemy. In this case, our Blood Angels Legionaries have a Ballistic skill of 4. 7 minus 4 is 3, meaning they'll need a 3 plus in order to hit with their Bolters. So I'm rolling 10 dice, one for each of the Marines. And for every roll of a 3 up, I've hit. I'm going to go in and remove any that are a 2 or less. And that still leaves me with a very healthy 7 hit. Any shots that miss at this stage are taken out and put to one side. They don't proceed any further. Note that a one is always a miss. With our hit rolls done, the next step is a roll to wound. We hit with seven out of our 10 bolter shots. So next we're gonna see how many of those manage to successfully wound the enemy. For this, we compare the strength value of the weapon we're shooting with against the toughness value of the models we're shooting. Again, there's a table in the rulebook for this. One useful trick here, if you've got the same strength on the weapon as you have toughness on the model, it's going to always be a four, five, or six to wound, otherwise called a four plus. So we're rolling seven dice to wound. And we're looking for fours. We've only managed to wound with two of those. So those two shots are deemed to have wounded the Alpha Legion, which means we can move on to the next step where they get to attempt to save the wounds using their power armor. For this, the Alpha Legion player refers to the save characteristic of their models. Because they're all equipped in power armor, they're going to have a three plus armor save. That means they need to roll above a three on their D6 in order to save the wound. So rolling those two wounds, and we can see that the Alpha Legion player has failed to save one, but the other one has been saved by the armor. That means that one of the Alpha Legion has been slain, whereas the second shot was deflected by the power armor of the next Legionary. And so that's the shooting phase. Pause the video here to get a couple of rounds in, where the first player can move and then shoot, and then the second player can move and shoot back. Once you're happy with to hit, to wound, and saving throws, we can move on to the next phase, which is the assault phase. So let's next come to the assault phase. We've restored our units back to full fighting strength, and during the assault phase is where they charge into bloody close combat. The assault phase is broken down into two parts called sub-phases, the charge sub-phase and the fight sub-phase. During the charge sub-phase, units charge at each other in order to get into close combat. To charge, choose a unit you want to charge with, and then select an enemy unit within 12 inches as the target of the charge. There's always a chance that your charge might fail though. In order to represent this, you now roll 2d6 and compare the value with the distance that the enemy units are away. If you roll greater than this distance, your unit has successfully made it into combat. Let's look at an example of a successful charge now. The unit is about six inches away from the Alpha Legion, meaning they'll need to make a six inch charge. 
I roll my 2d6. And this time I roll a 7, which means they're going to make it into combat. First, move one of the models into base-to-base -base contact with the enemy. And then move the rest of the squad, making sure to move them into unit coherency, which means they need to be within two inches of at least one other model from the squad. These units are now locked in combat, meaning they will not leave until one of the units is completely wiped out or one of them fails a morale test, which we'll cover in a later part of the video. One other thing to note here is that models with a higher movement characteristic will actually get bonuses to charge. It's not relevant for our marines today because all of them have movement 7, but with faster models you'll actually get a bonus of maybe plus 1 or even plus 2 when making charge rolls. But let's look next at what happens if you fail your charge move. In this example, the Blood Angels are starting just over 11 inches away from the Alpha Legion, meaning they'll need an 11 inch charge to get into base to base combat. I'm going to roll my 2d6, and this time they've only rolled an 8, which means they have failed their charge. When this happens, instead of just standing still, they will make what's called a surge move. Now for this, the models move half the distance that was rolled on the dice, in this case 4 inches. Note that if they'd rolled a 7 inch charge, they'd still move 4 inches, as you always want to round up your dice rolls. If one or more units made it into combat during the charge subphase, it's on to the fight subphase. In the fight subphase, all units get a chance to fight, not just those controlled by the active player. The fight phase, similar to the shooting phase, also follows a hit, wound and saving throw model. However, unlike the shooting phase, you also have to take into account the speed of the combatants in the fight, which is represented by their initiative. To do this, you need to look at the combat and work out the different initiative steps. The units with the highest initiative fight first, starting with initiative 10, and then going down to initiative 9 and 8, all the way down to initiative 1. As both of our units here are initiative 4, they're actually both going to fight simultaneously, meaning all their attacks will be resolved at the same time. At each initiative step, each of the models with that initiative fights. In this case, we'll only be fighting at initiative step 4. When you charge an enemy unit, you get plus one attack on every model in the charging unit for the remainder of that assault phase. That means the Blood Angels are going to get a whopping 20 attacks this turn, each of them has one attack as a baseline, and they each get plus one attack for charging. The Alpha Legion are each going to get one attack, meaning a grand total of 10 attacks are going to come back. Now we'll roll for the Blood Angels first, but remember that any Alpha Legion removed as casualties will still get to fight because they are fighting at the same initiative step of four. First we roll to hit. In this case, we compare the weapon skill of all the units in the combat. In this case, our Blood Angels Tactical Squad and our Alpha Legion Tactical Squad are both weapon skill 4. Compare these values to the weapon skill chart, which you'll find in the Age of Darkness rulebook, and you'll find that weapon skill 4 against weapon skill 4 means a 4 plus is needed to hit. So we're going to start off with the Blood Angels attacks. They've got 20 attacks, two each for each model because they charged. They're weapon skill 4 against weapon skill 4, which means they're hitting on 4s. Now there's quite a lot of misses there. We missed with 11 out of the 20 shots. That means that we've got 9 potential wounds. Rolling to wounds, we compare the strength of the marines, which is strength 4, against the toughness of the Alpha Legion, which is also toughness 4. If you don't see any melee weapons on your models, just use the base strength of the model. In this case, the base strength of a tactical legionary is 4. Looking for fours, and we've managed to score two wounds on the Alpha Legion. We're going to take those two dice, and this time the Alpha Legion player is going to roll to try and save them. The save is a three plus, so we need to show a three or higher on the dice. That's one saved, but one goes through, meaning one of the Alpha Legionnaires is slain. It's now time for the Alpha Legion to fight back. And so that's the assault phase. Now the next thing we're going to look at is the morale phase, but feel free to play a couple of rounds with just the rules that you've been introduced so far so that you can get the hang of it. With their brothers dying around them or fleeing in terror, it's common for the soldiers of the 31st millennium to lose their nerve and to break and run away. This is represented in the game by morale checks. To make a morale check, you roll 2d6 and compare that value to the unit's leadership. The leadership on a tactical legionary is only 7, so you'll see that it's actually quite likely for them to fail this check, which will result in them running away. 
Note that even if the odds seem insurmountable, if you can roll a double one on a leadership check, it's always a pass, and it's a rule called insane bravery. If you pass the morale check, nothing further happens. Units that are in combat remain in combat, and other units will remain as they are. However, if the morale test is failed, your unit will immediately make a fallback move. When you make a fallback move, you roll 2d6, and then you have to move your unit that failed the morale test that many inches back towards your own battlefield edge. If any of your units makes it into contact with one of the battlefield edges, that unit is removed as a casualty and they have run away from the war zone. If they stay on the board, when it next comes time to move that unit, they must make another morale check. If they pass, then they can move as normal, but if they fail, they must continue to fall back, moving another 2d6 inches towards your table edge. So when do you need to check for morale? There are three main reasons why you might need to do so. Number one, when you lose 25% or more of the models in a squad in a single phase. Note that this doesn't apply to the assault phase or to reactions as we'll see later on. The second reason to take a morale test is in the movement phase after you've already failed a morale test to see if you can regroup or if you keep running. And the third reason is whenever you lose an assault. You are deemed to have lost an assault when you have lost more wounds on your squad than the enemy squad that you were fighting. The assault morale check is particularly punishing because you also suffer a minus one penalty for every additional wound the enemy inflicted on you compared with how many you inflicted on them. In this example, let's imagine that the Blood Angels have inflicted four casualties on the Alpha Legion, therefore inflicting four wounds, where the Alpha Legion have only managed to kill back two of the Marines. Once these models are removed, and the combat is resolved, the Alpha Legion are deemed to have lost combat by two wounds, meaning they'll suffer a minus two penalty to their leadership. That means they need to roll a five or less to stay around in the combat. They've rolled a 10, which means they will run away. They immediately make a full back move, in this case, moving two D6 inches back towards their battlefield edge. They're gonna be running eight inches. If a unit falls back from combat, it's extra dangerous for them, as there's a chance that their attackers might pursue them and cut them down as they run away. In game, this is represented by a rule called Sweeping Advance. To perform a Sweeping Advance, both players roll a d6 and add the initiative of the models in the combat. If the winning player rolls higher, then the Sweeping Advance is successful and the losing models are removed as casualties. So let's continue with the previous example. After failing their morale check, the Alpha Legion are falling back, and the Blood Angels player is going to declare a sweeping advance. The Blood Angels player rolls a dice, adding four, getting a grand total of six. The Alpha Legion player then rolls a d6, adding his initiative. He's only rolled a five. That means that the Alpha Legion are removed as casualties as they're cut down while running away. And with morale out of the way, that's the core phases of a game of Horus Heresy all covered. How did your practice battles go? Was it victory for the forces of the Emperor or insipid wins for the traitor legions? Let me know in the comments down below. While you're down there, let me know if you have any questions about what we covered in today's video, as I'll be more than happy to answer them. I look forward to catching you in the next video where we'll be discussing reactions, weapon profiles, and a lot more. So stay tuned. And in the meantime, my name has been Ollie. This has been my hobby. And I'll see you next time.